Hello, my name is Dr. Sanjay Matthew at Baylor College of Medicine, and I'm pleased to um, take part in this webinar for ADAA. I'll be talking about medications for anxiety disorders and PTSD, and specifically things that are available today, but also what may be available in the future in, the, in terms of research and clinical trials over the next few years. So um, also hope to be able to answer some questions at the end with Q and A. And by way of disclosures, I've consulted with some companies who work in drug development and also participated in some clinical trials funded by industry and have grant support from uh, both governmental and non-governmental sources. We'll be talking about the prevalence and burden of anxiety disorders and PTSD, talk about the most commonly administered class of medications with respect to anxiety, which are the benzodiazepines, but also what's in the future with respect to uh, GABAergic type drugs, which is what uh, benzodiazepines work on, a neurochemical called GABA, and then disorder specific developments focusing on GAD and social anxiety disorder, where most of the interest in terms of drug development has been, um, and then PTSD, where there's a lot of work being done, and then future directions. Just by way of overview, and man many of you are familiar with this already, but in case you're not, the fact that anxiety disorders are extremely common. One in four adults will suffer from an anxiety disorder at some point in their lifetime. And you can see in this diagram, the breakdown of the different types of anxiety disorders. Generalized anxiety disorder is what we'll be focused on and social anxiety disorder, but there's, there are other ones as well. And then of course, in DSM, we don't classify OCD at the anxiety disorders it has its own chapter as well as PTSD has its own section on trauma and stress-related disorders, which is a change from the old DSM. And these are very common conditions. You look at the lifetime and 12-month prevalence of, of depression and these disorders, good part of the population. And the lifetime comorbidity with depression is quite high. So GAD, more than uh, half of patients will have a lifetime depression. So that tends to run the closest with depression. And th because these disorders strike the young and they strike in your teenage years or early 20s, these tend to be associated with a lot of disability it, compared to neurodegenerative disorders, stroke, dementias, and so on, which are generally in late life. So these strike the young in their healthy working years. And as a result, anxiety and unipolar depression are the leading causes of disability. It's, it's quite, quite striking. And we're, we're of course in the middle of a suicide epidemic. The numbers keep going up over the last 15 years. The numbers post COVID, th there's some concerning numbers as well about suicide attempts. And you see this, the male fem female differences. Um, some of this is attributed to veteran suicide, which which can be comprised a significant proportion of all suicides, returning veterans or veterans in, in active military or military, active uh, military personnel. And along with that, and which overlaps with the suicide epidemic is the over, opioid overdose epidemic as well, uh, where those numbers keep going up. And that's where the safety concerns with benzodiazepines are a real issue as when you look at what are sort of the commonly co-administered drugs and opioid overdose deaths, benzodiazepines are unfortunately seen in a proportion of those patients. And the combination can lead to a lethal uh, respiratory depression and, and death. So what are the unmet needs for drug therapy? We have numerous antidepressants that have been repurposed for anxiety the SSRI class, so-called SNRI, meaning serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And there can be effective, although the differences between placebo can be modest. They can be on the order of 5%. They could be 10%. So they may not be huge so-called effect sizes. Side effects can be problematic. 
including sexual side effects, weight gain are, are some of the most commonly reported ones, but you see GI, gastrointestinal side effects, nausea, vomiting. You do get some induction of cycling for uh, cycling of mood for some patients. You can get headaches. So, so a number of side effects. They work slow. They, they don't work immediately, unlike the benzos, which can work immediately within a day, two days. You can get much less anxious in a few days. These are relatively slow onset. And then ironically, we don't know much about how these drugs, the classic drugs work relative to suicide ideation behavior. The reason for that is these patients are generally uh, not allowed into the trial. So they're excluded from the trial for safety considerations. So we actually know very little about how the drugs perform in perhaps the most seriously ill and at risk patients. And in PTSD, we only have two FDA approved SSRIs. These are sertraline and paroxetine. We have more approved in GAD and social anxiety, panic disorder, but still relative to the disability, the burden, the prevalence, very little. And you compare that to depression where we have 30 plus antidepressants, which have received FDA approval over the years, over the last 40 plus years. So a word about benzodiazepines and the future of benzodiazepines, which are these so-called next generation GABA modulators, GABA being the major inhibitory amino acid neurotransmitter in the brain, which is what benzos work on. This is a study showing that despite the issues with benzos, namely the risk of dependence, tolerance, risk of potential interaction effects with alcohol, with opiates, the rates of prescribing continue to go up. And these are, this is a schematic of all benzos, short-acting benzos, long-acting benzos. Now, of course, these are used for things beyond anxiety. They're used for insomnia, for chronic pain conditions, and neurological conditions. But across all indications, you see a increase in the use. And that's with or without opioids. So in orange, with opioids, even that is going up. And so that's an alarming statistic. Now, the benzos are, that we have many of them. Um, they're generally thought of in several buckets, depending on how long they act or what is the el elimination half-life, how long do they stay in your system. There are ones that stay in your system a very long time, and like diazepam and, or Valium, and ones that are, are shorter uh, duration, uh, like alprazolam or Xanax and then all kinds of drugs in between. So clonazepam is somewhere in between. And there's many useful uh, tables such as this one that shows the comparative milligram per milligram potency. So if you are trying to compare five milligrams of diazepam, that would roughly be equivalent to one milligram of lorazepam or Ativan, or 0.25 or 0.5 milligrams of clonazepam. 0.5 of alprazolam, and so on. And, and they all have differences. And so these are not, it's not a monolithic entity, the benzodiazepines, uh, but very uh, different and heterogeneous. And so many factors go into, if you are going to select a benzodiazepine as a clinician, you want to look at the, how, how did the patient do in the past on a specific one? And maybe, maybe that's the one to go to again. You, you may look at FDA approval. Certain ones of these are specifically FDA approved for specific anxiety disorders, such as clonazepam or alprazolam. Look at the safety tolerability and the drug-drug interactions. Some of them tend to have more, some less. The need for speed in terms of how quickly does it, uh, can it, does it cross the blood-brain barrier and, and act in, um, brain circuits that, that mediate anxiety. Half-life considerations we talked about, some are very long lasting in the, in the body. And then does the patient have any specific preference? Now the FDA in a note to prescribers and to clinicians issued an updated warning. Of course, there've been warnings throughout the years regarding the potential risks of tolerance and dependence. 
but the, the FDA felt, given the opioid epidemic, that, that there was a need to uh, reiterate this warning, an updated warning. And this can be an important treatment option. We all know that, and they continue to be used because they do have a role in anxiety treatment, particularly for those who may not have fared so well with either behavioral approaches, psychotherapy approaches, um, other types of non-drug therapy approaches, including mindfulness, meditation, um, and so on. But the message here is even when taken at recommended doses, their use can lead to misuse, abuse, and addiction. So we should not take these drugs casually. And in for some conditions, namely PTSD, we probably don't want to use them at all. They're commonly used, but they have very little evidence base for it. In animal models, preclinically, they may actually interfere with fear extinction, and they may actually enhance the ability to acquire fear. The clinical trials have been very few and far between, but the, what evidence we have is not generally supportive. Clonazepam was no different from placebo in controlling nightmares, but meta-analysis found them to be potentially harmful. And it's something we don't want to give immediately after a trauma. It could actually increase risk of PTSD. So we should use them with caution uh, for PTSD or after recent trauma exposure. And we certainly um, have to be used with caution in the substance abusing patient with PTSD, which is a not uncommon uh, comorbidity. So what do we do as an alternative? If you're using the benzo for nighttime dosing for insomnia, we do have a lot of options. The non-benzodiazepine hypnotics, the so-called Z drugs, which may include Zolpidem or Ambien or as Zopiclone, so-called Lunesta. But then we also have a number of sedating antidepressants, which we use at low doses, can be helpful for insomnia as an alternative to to uh, benzodiazepines, trazodone, mirtazapine, most commonly used. We have Romelteon, which is a, a melatonergic agent, works in the melatonin system, circadian rhythm, and resetting of circadian uh, rhythms. Th then we have two newer drugs, which work on a peptide called orexin. Orexin is a neuropeptide secreted in part of the brain that's important for uh, sleep wake regulation and arousal. Um, these drugs are called Suvorexent and Lemborexent, which is more recently FDA approved. They block the expression of this peptide, dampening arousal and hopefully dampening nighttime awakenings, and improving insomnia. And then yet another uh, low dose antidepressant, in this case a low dose tricyclic antidepressant called doxepin which has been around a long time and can be used at 10 milligram capsules or even smaller doses, lower doses, three milligrams or six milligrams in a tablet form for insomnia. Now, if we're using the benzos for daytime anxiety, you could think of hydroxazine, which is a antihistamine. You could use an antiadrenergic drug, which dampens norepinephrine arousal, adrenergic arousal, used also for nightmares and PTSD. And then drugs that, that are anticonvulsant mechanisms. And we'll talk more about pregabalin. It's an anticonvulsant with extensive data supporting its benefit in GAD. And we, we do use a lot of that off label. It's not FDA approved in this country for uh, psychiatric indications, although it is approved in Europe for that. Now, there is a relationship between GABA and neuroactive steroids from the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway. So uh, cholesterol is um, synthesized into allopregnenolone, which is a neuroactive steroid. And allopregnenolone has activity at GABA-A receptors. There are GABA-A receptors inside the synapse, so-called synaptic uh, GABA-A receptors, which are sensitive to benzodiazepines, but are associated with abuse liability, tolerance, and dependence. And then where there's been a lot of interest in drug discovery, drug development, are these so-called extrasynaptic benzodiazepine insensitive GABA-A receptors. And we'll talk about one specific drug called SAGE-217, uh, brexanolone, um, and it works 
presumably in a different manner by focusing on extrasynaptic receptors, which does not have the dependency tolerance or addiction liability that, that um, the benzos do. And so these are being pursued for a depression and there's been a lot of interest in also anxiety as well. And this is just um, a table of some of the companies who are working in this space. Uh, furthest along is the Sage Therapeutics compound, which is so-called so Sage 217, Zoranolone. And this was the early study, the earliest study in depression, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which found rapid reductions in depression scores. This is in red, the Sage 217 at 30 milligrams, uh, which was significantly, uh, statistically significant uh, compared to placebo in a short period of time. And then more recent studies also found uh, with a higher dose, with a 50 milligram dose in the so-called waterfall study, that within a several day period, there were statistically significant separation as early as the day three, day eight, day um, 12, and then at the primary endpoint of day 15, favoring the drug over placebo. So there are a con other studies being conducted with this compound, the hope if all goes well, that this is something that we would see on the market in the next couple of years with indication of a depression, but uh, down the road, presumably other studies in related disorders such as anxiety would be, would be very important to conduct. Now, generalized anxiety disorder, I think one of the take home messages is you want to be thinking in terms of pharmacotherapy that the patient has more than a 50% lifetime risk of depression. They likely have low, many patients will have low grade depressive symptoms. And so ideally, if you have a drug or an intervention that, that can hit both of the symptom clusters of depression as well as anxiety, as well as this very large overlap. Many of these patients will have the insomnia, will have uh, sleep disturbance, uh, the psychomotor agitation, concentration impairments, irritability. So these overlap symptoms, if there's a drug that can hit both of these, as opposed to using an anxiety drug plus an antidepressant, that would certainly be ideal. Now, what is approved? The things that are approved in GAD by the US FDA tend to be repurposed antidepressants. So you are hitting both depression and anxiety. You can see here in the table, we have two SNRIs and two SSRIs. Now, many of you have probably heard of Boostbar, or um, if, if you're a patient, you've tried it yourself. boosparone has been around many years. It's not technically FDA approved for GAD because it's designated pr prior to the FDA designations for GAD, but it is it works similar to an SSRI, not exactly the same. It, it, it works on something called the serotonin 1A receptor as a partial agonist. And so it enhances the activity of serotonin at that receptor. Uh, we did note that pregabalin, and, and I should note that Buspar is sometimes used in conjunction with an SSRI for partial responders or patients who have an incomplete response to an SSRI. Pregabalin was approved in Europe, not in the US. It's approved in this country for um, seizure disorder, for fibromyalgia, for post-herpetic um, neuro neuropathic pain, et cetera. Uh, pain conditions primarily as well as uh, you know, fibromyalgia. Treatment algorithm, I'm not gonna go through all those details. It's a busy slide. There's a very good reference uh, on this and there's many different ways to think of the treatment algorithm, but by and large, all these algorithms, you start with an SSRI and for partial responders, you could either switch to an alternative or augment. And it includes all the way down for very refractory situations to using an atypical antipsychotic. Pregabalin, we talked about, um, this was one of the early studies showing that it had a rapid onset of action as early as week one. Uh, compared in comparison to lorazepam, the benzodiazepine. So it was comparably quick to work within a week, and it continued to work at a higher dose through week four. Along the way, the field has struggled to develop new drugs, and 
there's been a decade plus of frustration and failed studies that have failed to separate from placebo. Multiple different uh, biochemical mechanisms, um, including stress axes, so-called CRF1 receptors, then other hormonal receptors, including vasopressin receptor antagonists, other um, types of modulators of the GABA system, and a drug called troriliazole, which is a repurposed uh, metabolite of a drug used in Lou Gehrig's disease, or riliazole, which is a glutamatergic drug, which we'll be hearing more about. And we did a study many years ago looking at riliazole, which is the Lou Gehrig's disease drug, and found some efficacy in GAD. Uh, then industry, specifically Biohaven, did a study, large study, phase three, 400 patients, which unfortunately did not find a anxiety reducing effect separated from placebo. So there was no uh, significant benefit of the drug. And so that program was, was then halted. So the uh, glutamate system, we talked about GABA inhibitory amino acid. Glutamate is the main excitatory amino acid system. It, you could think of it as the sort of the driver of the brain found in multiple uh, cells in the brain, 80% of neurons contain glutamate, multiple receptor systems, multiple receptor targets. And uh, this is a very busy, complex slide. The only take home point is it's a system that drug developers are really interested in and are interrogating it, looking at it very closely. In red, I list some of the programs and some of the names of the drugs that are being pursued. Uh, as novel antidepressants with potential relevance to anxiety, particularly GAD as well. Social anxiety disorder, we know the SSRIs have approvals, several of them as listed here on the left side, paroxetine, sertraline, fluvoxamine, uh, but we also use escitalopram, venlafaxine is FDA approved. We do use, particularly for speech phobia, or, or stage fright, we may use beta blockers, which can decrease the autonomic drive and clamp down on sweating and some of those type of symptoms. You can use a benzodiazepine, particularly the quicker acting ones and the anticonvulsants. And this is a, a classic study by Murray Steen in JAMA a number of years ago, showing that when you give a scale like the Leibowitz social anxiety scale for generalized social phobia, you do have significant improvements in chronically daily administered Paxil paroxetine for um, a 12 week period or three months compared to placebo. And so that the SSRIs have been the standard of practice for moderate severe forms of social anxiety disorder. Now, what's novel, what's new, what are drug developers looking at? This is a completely different approach. It's not an oral drug, it's not a daily, approach. This is an intranasal spray, a odorless so-called fairy nasal spray. So it's not systemically absorbed. And the idea is you're, you're spraying uh, this molecule that then impacts nasal neurons that have connections to brain circuits involved in fear generation and the fear response. And so this is uh, a company called Vistagen. They're doing a study uh, of a drug called PH94B. They're now in late stage trials, so-called phase three studies. And it's, it's not a typical study where you're looking at uh, outcomes on a specific rating scale. Here, it's a laboratory-based challenge where you ask the patient to come in, give a talk. I mean, nothing is more stressful than giving a talk to strangers spontaneously for five minutes and your units of distress go up remarkably in the drug group, if you pre-medicate with the drug, you see lower distress compared to the placebo arm. And so that uh, is, is what's being pursued in these larger phase three studies. So, so hopefully we'll get some, some results in the next year or so regarding that. Ketamine has been in the news and very many of you are familiar with it for its use in depression and data more recently in PTSD. This is just a 
example of yet another indication. There have been studies in GAD, social anxiety, PTSD, OCD, and by and large, they've been consistent in showing a rapid onset of benefit uh, for uh, this. But the challenges, of course, have been how do you maintain the benefit? The benefit tends to be transient, of course, if you give just one infusion or one IV infusion. So PTSD probably has the most work going on it right now with respect to drug development and things that are in the pipeline. Just a reminder why, because they're, they're, it's a common disease, common in veterans, military, non-military populations as well, and only two FDA approved medications. And so we end up using tons of things off label and with questionable evidence. Some of the best data most recently for SSRIs was done by Sheila Rausch, who's ADAA board member. And she did in, in uh, funded by the DOD of the large multi-center trial, comparing the standard of practice psychotherapy regimen, which is prolonged exposure to sertraline or, or SSRI treatment or the combination. And essentially didn't find any statistical significantly different across the three arms. Uh, across this 24 week study. Uh, there was perhaps a suggestion that sertraline did pretty well uh, in terms of overall response rates, although it wasn't statistically separated. Uh, medications used with caution, we, we talked about benzodiazepines already, but some of these others have either negative data or strongly suggestive negative data relative to placebo, including some of these atypical antipsychotic VA cooperative type studies. And there have been a bunch of other things that have failed, unfortunately. We talked about CRF, stress-related uh, peptide antagonist, but a study we were involved in a decade plus ago, substance P or neurokinin-1 antagonist. Muscle relaxants have been studied. Prazosin used in nightmares and PTSD extensively in the VA, adrenergic blocker. Here, the, the graphs here show absolutely no benefit relative to placebo in a VA large cooperative study, the largest ever done, a prazosin, a couple other drugs that were repurposed and unfortunately all failed. So the field has been really desperate for some success and there has been some success. And we'll talk about MDMA, ecstasy, uh, which recently uh, reported out a trial in phase three. We'll talk about, and then we'll talk about uh, this NMDA receptor, which is a glutamate receptor oral drug uh, that showed some, some benefit in the early phase two. Psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is all the rage right now. A lot of interest in psilocybin and in MDMA, psilocybin for depression primarily, but also some work ongoing in PTSD. And the idea is this is uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So it's a psychotherapy platform. The emphasis is on preparation of the patient prior to giving the drug, allowing the patient to explore the psychedelic experience and then guiding them and interpreting them and hopefully making some long-term changes. And this is just what, what this looks like in practice. The patient has earphones listening to specific music. They have eye shades and then two therapists are there in a supportive uh, manner during the sessions. So the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy comprised of three different medication sessions uh, conducted over a couple month period. And you can see that there were statistically significant improvements in the CAPS PTSD rating scale uh, compared to the placebo arm. And there's also improvements in disability and in depression. The effect size was in the large range so just to put that in perspective, what does 0.91 really mean? For the SSRIs, the effect size for SSRIs are about 0 0.25, 0 0.30, very small effects. A moderate effect size is considered 0 0.50 or so. So effect size here were large compared to placebo. And so this is extremely promising. Of course, it wasn't a huge sample size. There are ongoing confirmatory trials of MDMA, and then as mentioned, psilocybin and other um, uh, sort of hallucinogens, you may say. Uh, MDMA is not really a hallucinogen, it's more what we call an empathogen or intactogen. 
uh, psilocybin is more of a plastic hallucinogen by its mechanism, as is LSD and ayahuasca or DMT. And they have a common mechanism of agonism of the serotonin 2A receptor. And it's a uh, plant alkaloid derived from tryptamine precursors. And you can see there's uh, recreational uses, formulations that can be used any number of ways. I mentioned this NMDA modulator drug that was positive in a phase 2A study. So it's now being pursued for larger phase two studies. So that, that's exciting that there is a, uh, it's a different mechanism than ketamine. Ketamine here is an NMDA antagonist as one of its initial mechanisms of actions. So it blocks activity within the NMDA channel. Um, there's a lot of theories as to how that works in depression. It may be because of non-NMDA activity entirely. There, there's clearly some activity at the mu opioid receptor, enhancement of, of um, peptides related to endorphins and kephalins. Um, but you see these rapid reductions in antidepressants, antidepressant activity uh, with single infusions. And then when you, in PTSD, when you give repeated infusions as Adriana Fetter most recently demonstrated uh, that repeated infusions three times a week over two weeks resulted in rapid improvements in PTSD symptoms, a lower in ketamine with very large effect sizes greater than one with a 76% response rate in the ketamine arm versus 20% response rate in the active comparator or midazolam, which is a benzodiazepine. So this uh, busy slide is not, not to really drill down on all the details here outside of knowing that it's very heartening to know that we're looking at a lot of different mechanisms and hopefully this new generation of drugs will have more success this decade than what we unfortunately found last decade with a lot of negative studies. So anything from NMDA modulation to inhibition of specific um, ch channels, uh, something called the TRIP-C4, TRIP-C5, and um, selective glucocorticoid or stress-related um, hormone receptor antagonists. Um, these are inhibitors, uh, FA inhibitors that impact the endocannabinoid system, which what marijuana um, impacts, and then even drugs that bind THC, the active ingredient in marijuana with CBD, combination cannabis extract, and then other, other mechanisms at play here. So it's a very busy time. Phase two, for <coughs> those are not familiar, phase one are studies, the initial studies for safety and healthy volunteers. Phase two are the initial studies in patients with smaller sample size, essentially proof of mechanism, proof of concept. And then the pivotal late phase studies are phase three, which are the, the ones prior to FDA approval. So these are still early days uh, in phase two for, for the ones listed here. And then this is one of the ones that are, that are being studied and um, the study is, is launching in PTSD. And then this is schematic from Martin Paulus from one of his webinars. He was talking about the FA in inhibition and modulating cannabinoids may help to reduce anxiety. And so this is a, a very active area of investigation. So there's at least one FA inhibitor being pursued in anxiety and several others um, for other indications. So future directions, NIH has been very interested in experimental therapeutics where you're using a biomarker, either MRI or EEG or some kind of proxy of target engagement, which informs the decision to pursue a clinical trial and a clinical endpoint. And the idea is we have all these ideas and we have all these possible targets, be they neuropeptides, be they neurotransmitters, be they specific receptors, be, be they ion channels, um, G protein coupled receptors, et cetera. How do we sort of look at these different mechanisms in a rational way, but also not take a decade to only discover that the drug was no good and didn't beat placebo. So the concept is most 
NMEs or new molecular entities will fail. So how can we fail faster and more efficiently and fail smart and learn something in the process? So can you look at the drug's impact on a specific biomarker that has validated and has some kind of relationship to the clinical endpoint of interest, be it anxiety or trauma, and see if that change in the biomarker can be linked eventually to changes in uh, clinical phenotype. And this is one example of a fast-fail type study looking at a novel drug mechanism, in this case, the kappa opiate receptor antagonism. And then the biomarker of interest was how a patient's brain responded to a specific task, a reward task. The hypothesis being that kappa opiate antagonism would help anhedonia and improve a brain activity in reward circuits while performing this specific uh, so-called monetary incentive delay task or reward task. And indeed, that's what was found in the study. There were improvements in the um, ventral striatal activation and anticipation of rewards on this task. There was also improvements in anhedonia clinically, but that was not the primary focus. And then James Murrow uh, led a study in which we were part of that collaboration with NIH a funded study looking at a similar concept with a different drug uh, and looking at a very similar fMRI reward task, finding not only changes in that reward task, but also changes in depression and anhedonia. And then we, we recently did a study repurposing a NMDA antagonist and looking at its impact on um, EEG, something called gamma band activity which is a proxy for excitation and inhibition balance. And we did find some interesting effects on gamma band activity, uh, as well as some suggestive effects on subscales of the caps. So the take home points are that anxiety disorders are prevalent, they're common, disabling. In fact, that and depression are the two most common sources of disability. We have very strong support for the efficacy of drug therapy and evidence-based structured psychotherapies, exposure therapies, most common CBT uh, type of therapies for anxiety. SSRIs remain solid first choices. And when in doubt, you're probably going to prescribe an SSRI uh, because of its benefit for the anxiety, but also for the depression that tends to run with it. And they remain solid first choices for many patients but they have limitations in terms of side effects, speed of onset, the things that we were talking about. And so you could think of alternatives on an individual basis of SNRIs, newer agents, anticonvulsant antihistamines, and so on, because clearly there are patients who don't respond to the standard on-label approaches. And then for PTSD, benzodiazepines take home point, have a limited role here, and the pipeline in terms of new drugs is, is pretty exciting. And it's a varied mechanism, including glutamate and MDA modulation. So thank my team um, at Baylor and collaborators at the different institutions and in industry. And thank you for your attention and be, hope, be happy to answer questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Matthew. Um, I do have a few questions for you, and then we always invite any of our viewers to send in their questions, which I will happily send over to you. Um, so for clinicians or for patients who are looking into this, what is the best piece of advice you can give them on how to research these medications and what's coming down the path? Where can I find this information? Yeah, in, in terms of researching medications, um, good sources of information include ADAA. ADA has a website uh, that has some useful information about psychotropic medications. Um, there are websites like drugs.com and nimh.gov, National Institute of Mental Health, has some useful information about um, medications for these uh, types of disorders. But, okay, but but so websites are useful, but when in doubt, really seek out your clinician um, because, I mean, what you read may be difficult to understand or you really, if there's a lot of questions, you, you want to go through it with your clinician. Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you. Um, we were discussing the medications and the pharmacology of it, but what is the hand-in-hand -hand partnership between clinical care and the medicines and how does that impact um, treatment? Yeah, so clinical care and clinical management is essential um, in all contexts, um, be it if you're giving specific behavioral therapy type uh, techniques or cognitive behavioral type therapies. Um, it's interesting that the in that study I showed by Dr. Rausch and colleagues, enhanced medication management, meaning psychoeducation about medications, uh, ensuring that there's good adherence, because a big challenge, of course, is is the patient taking the medicine as mm -hmm. prescribed and not taking it once a week if it's a daily medication? Are they in fact taking it every single day and not missing? So uh, there, there's a lot of stuff that goes beyond just taking the medicine and getting the, the prescription filled, uh, addressing adherence, addressing side effects, adjusting the dose, giving behavioral lifestyle management options, in terms of exercise, in terms of sleep hygiene, in terms of diet, nutrition counseling, all of these things we, we want to consider in the context of good clinical care. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we did see great success in the MDMA effect size for PTSD. Um, in terms of research, with an effect size like that, how does it impact the next stages of research and what would the timeline on, on the completion of a study might be? Yeah, so for the MDMA program, it's now in the last legs. The study that I showed with the high effect size was a phase three study. Generally, the FDA wants two independent phase three studies prior to approval. So if the uh, organization called MAPS, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, they're the sponsor of this program for MDMA. If they have an additional phase three adequately powered multicenter placebo controlled trial, we would anticipate FDA approval at that, after that point, Great. which could be in the next, I don't wanna make predictions about that, but <laughs> probably 2023. Wow, that is very soon. Um, I wanna thank you for joining us today. Um, I believe that there was an amazing amount of important information here and uh, the webinar will be available on demand. Um, so if we have any further questions, please email webinars at ADAA.org. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.